Welcome to the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast, the first and longest running female hosted hunting podcast. When she's not gearing up for turkey season, she's helping you navigate your trip of a lifetime. And now, here's your hostess, Carrie Zilka. Welcome to the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast. I'm your hostess, Carrie Zilka. This week, we're talking to Brian Koch from Ultimate Upland. You can find him on Twitter at Ultimate Upland. If you remember, he was a guest on episode 98, and this week we're going to talk about bird hunting in New Mexico. The show notes for this episode can be found at the website huntfishtravel.net under the show tab. Brian, welcome back to the show. Good to be here as always. Always (laughs) great to be with the wonderful Z, hear what she's been up to, and then ask me questions that I don't know the answer to about bird hunting. (laughs) I'm sure it'll be a fun interview. So, let's talk What have you been up to? So you've been doing a lot of periscoping. And for anybody who doesn't know what Periscope is, it's a live streaming app. And Brian is very prolific on on Periscope. Why don't you tell them a little bit about what you've been live streaming lately? Uh, And not very much important stuff lately. I think Periscope, it feels like it should be like the next frontier for social media, especially in in hunting where you can, you know, take people with you. Um, And now... It's kind of being tied in. A GoPro announced, a, or a combination of GoPro and, and, and Periscope announced that you can use your GoPro cameras now. Mm-hmm. So really, first-person hunting experience through live broadcast is becoming more and more real. Um, there's not a lot of hunters on there right now. Um, we're, you know, I think it's growing, but uh, and, and I haven't broadcast in a little while because I haven't hunting season's over, but. You know, maybe when we start training and it starts warming up again, we'll, we'll get back to it. But I don't know. It's kind of fun to show people. Uh, I, I, the audience is so broad, um, and people just tap into you based on where you're located on a map or the title of your broadcast. And so it's a, I think it's a really cool, um, space to kind of talk to people who aren't hunters. You get really kind of crazy questions and, and fun interaction. And I, you know, I, I'm kind of down with that. It's fun. I mean, it's a little bit distracting from bird hunting. <laughs> but it's fun to take people on kind of short walks uh, or at least to get started and kind of show them what you're about. So that's kind of what I'm using it as right now. And see, that's a that's a really cool way to look. I always feel so stupid. Like when I first started up, I'm like, here I am. Nobody freaking cares what I'm doing anyway, but I'm going to show you anyhow. You know? and getting... That's kind of the way it is, though, right <laughs> now. It's like, you know, unless you're famous, quote unquote, you know, in another, you know, genre that, that you don't get a whole giant audience that yeah. takes so long to build an audience and whether they're actually watching Periscope right then, your videos are only up for 24 hours. There's an oddity to it. I feel like it's, I feel like it should be growing faster than what it is. I think that the hunting uh, industry is going to start using it more and more. Um, and hopefully that brings some more of our audience there. But yeah, I just have kind of fun just because there's such a I mean, you're getting people from all over the world watching. Yeah. You know, they're not coming in giant numbers, but at least they're uh, uh, you're exposing them to what you're up to. And I think it's hard sometimes in writing or even in interviews for people to grasp what it is that I'm doing, basically taking my two dogs out in the middle of nowhere, walking around on the hopes of finding birds. Um, and so it's kind of fun to bring those uh, uh, folks along and, and show them exactly how it's going now it is fun last summer i did a bunch of stuff like from while i was camping and i got questions that i just take the answers for for granted like people were like what lake is that oh lake michigan oh well i don't live in the u.s what you know and i'm like oh my gosh it's one of the great lakes and blah 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 blah. and they're like well how deep is it and all this stuff and it was kind of interesting answering some of those questions about things that i genuinely just take for granted <laughs> Yeah, it's it's wild, and, and, and it, because we've been doing it for a while and do a lot of fishing and a lot of hunting, it's it, those things. I, it, I think that's a, a a part of that misunderstanding gap between the, the hunting and non-hunting community. Uh, they have a stereotype built up in their heads about who we are, um, and and they don't watch the channels that that uh, normally hunting shows are on. Yeah, and so you know that stereotype type just persists and it's kind of a two-way street as well i mean oh, a lot yeah. of people on periscope that definitely aren't hunters that you know just are are interested and in, in, uh surprised to see that you know you can string together more than three words at a time <laughs> um, right i know <laughs> that you actually eat what you shoot i mean you know it's, it's those kind of questions that you could 
and, and people just have this idea in their head, and you know, so I think it's a great avenue to kind of yes. bridge that gap. Agreed. I have turned many a anti-hunter into just plain old non-hunters because they're when they realize that I'm not just some trophy hunter, you know, out to just decimate the herd or whatever. And so that's interesting. So yeah, I love Periscope. So was it right after ATA that you headed to New Mexico? Or oh, geez, no, it seems like so long ago. Well, I know. When was ATA? J- January, freaking the beginning of January, <laughs> like almost four months ago. Forever. No, uh, I, I did. I did this trip in between there. I finished out the season in New Mexico, which is mm-hmm. uh, so. Uh, for those of you not well versed in upland bird hunting, most upland bird hunters give up around Christmas time and stop hunting. The hardcore hunters persist on, uh, and then seasons throughout the country pretty much close down at the end of February. Uh, there's a few southern states that uh, continue into March, but. Um, end of February is pretty well the end of upland season, and, and New Mexico actually upland season ends on February 15th. So uh, I, I kind of uh, decided that, that uh, I hadn't hunted uh, desert quail before, and uh, so I decided that uh, that would be a good last stand for me and the dogs. Uh, been a long season, and uh, we're in the middle of a bunch of uh, upgrades to websites and stuff that's not as fun as uh, hunting now so we need to get that underway so uh yeah so we headed there uh, uh i think it was the first of february is when i headed down uh right around then just a brief 23 hour drive across the country hmm. brief and uh drove into the middle of the desert uh with just a little bit of intel and uh yeah it's uh, you know those long drives they don't seem to stop me anymore they don't even phase me 23 hours doesn't seem like that much that's crazy. Uh, That's a long time, dude. But the, yeah, it, <laughs> it, 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 I say that, but after like, so I try and come throw it in two days, right? So I just try and get there in two days, 12, two 12 hour days, and I'm there, and I'm like, oh boy, this is brutal. Um, out on the second day, but it's, uh, uh, New Mexico is like, uh, it's, if, for those who haven't been in New Mexico, that there's so much different terrain there, a lot of high desert, but, uh, in, in northeastern New Mexico, it's like this, uh, step country. I don't know. It's crazy prairies and stuff. I haven't, I've never seen before. I've, like I said, I've never hunted that far south. And, uh, part of the reason I haven't is because it's snake country. I mean, like mm-hmm. big time snake country. Um, and when you're hunting with upland dogs, um, you can train your dogs to, uh, be snake trained, quote unquote snake trained, where, um, you can limit their, uh, exposure to, uh, to poisonous snakes. But I was back across east across the Mississippi and there's not that many poisonous snakes here and not very many people that do snake training. Um, which involves basically having a, a, uh, caged rattlesnake, if you will. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you, uh, uh, east stem the dog when they indicate that they've seen the snake and hopefully the dog connects the negative stimulation with the snake and you don't have to worry about it in a while. But even guys that have, uh, snake train their dogs, to, uh, you know, sometimes they can end up. So in order to account for that, you, you know, I decided to go to New Mexico late in the season, which hopefully the snakes are all hibernating, sure. hold up because temperatures are lower. What, what, um, and by lower temperatures, because I think of New Mexico and I just think of blasted heat. Was it cold? But I guess it gets cold at night, huh? Because it's in the desert. Yeah, it's like a forty degree swing from from day to night. It's it's crazy, and but the, the bad part is, is so I show up there and they're having a record heat wave. <laughs> of and course, <laughs> it's getting up to be uh, uh, 70, uh, 75 degrees during the day, which is uh, twenty five twenty to twenty five degrees north of what um, it would normally would be, and. In February, I mean, so that's that's like the awakening time. Like when snakes start getting warmed up, when they start feeling the ground warm up, you know they're going to come out. Yeah. And so it really it, it kind of limited us, but it was getting down to the um, high twenties um, at night. So uh, you know twenty five, twenty six, and then it would go all the way up to seventy during the day, and then you know drop back down at night. Um, and so in those mor- so what we were, I was limiting my hunting to the morning basically, uh, and, and when it got to be. Uh, 10, 30, 11, temperatures start creeping up around the mid-60s, then we start heading back to the truck uh, because, uh, you know, it's not worth the risk. I mean, you're sure. talking about 
uh, every vial of antivenom. And I, I hear uh, Rio, my setter, was uh, uh, is from New Mexico, and my uh, breeder and friend is out there, and, he, and he's telling me about having dogs bit. And uh, the antivenom vials are like a thousand dollars a dose. Oh my gosh! Um, and and with no guarantee that it's yeah. uh, that it's gonna uh, fix your dog for sure, and the multi it, it, depending on the the uh, snake that bites and where it bites, you could go through two or three uh, doses. So it's uh it's not inexpensive for that. Uh, not the cost is a major factor, but it certainly uh, uh figures in. That's Most crazy. of folks out there, they actually do a uh, 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 vaccine. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people uh, east of the Mississippi know about it, um, and it's. <laughs> Supposed to be uh, uh, good for the for the venom, uh, and, and I actually had my lab do that before, um, but it's hard to find back east. But if sure. I do more hunting in the desert, I probably go there because my my uh, breeder friend swears by it, says that everybody out there who owns dogs does it, and uh, doesn't save all of them, but it uh, helps things. They got some nasty snakes out there. I mean, it's not just Western Diamondback, which Western Diamondbacks are nasty nasty snakes but uh and and a mean temperament but mm-hmm. got little hobbies mississaugas i mean i mean the list uh, there's like a list of six or seven different species of, of snakes that uh are pretty nasty creatures so really yeah yeah mm-hmm. the desert's a strange place i mean it's 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 awesome hunting i mean it, it's wide open amazing uh spaces to view but it's i mean everything in the desert either wants to bite you, stick you, or sting you. I mean, it's just, it, it's there's some wicked stuff out there. Like, are there scorpions and stuff? I don't know anything about New Mexico for everybody who's like, what a dumbass. No, I don't know anything about New Mexico. Are there, like, <laughs> yeah, scorpions there's, and there's, stuff out there? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, I mean, all of you got scorpions, you got some wicked spiders, I mean, you got uh, anything, I mean, literally, been, and I don't even know, like, three dozen different species of cactus, all of them wicked in some different form or other. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's a it's a crazy country and no water to be had. So we were hunting down around the Rio Grande, which is nice. But um but need that javelina out there, which javelina and dogs apparently don't mix real well. I learned that while I was out there from talking to wildlife officers. Really? Some, you know, we were within forty yards of some, which is, you know, and I was pulling the dogs back. But um yeah, it's 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 a strange uh, it, it literally is. Yeah, I've never hunted in a place like this. I've hunted all over the country, you know. But I mean, it's just yeah. the first uh, trip to the desert that we that we've made. And I'll go back, but it was a it was a steep, steep learning curve. I mean, very steep. <laughs> I can't even imagine. I guess I never really. I guess I didn't realize that. You know, you always hear about people going like elk hunting and stuff out there, and when they talk about gators and having snake boots, I guess now I really understand why. <laughs> yeah and in the winter time it's you know it's less of a concern most times unless sure. they have a record heat wave um but uh you know you can really limit your exposure and i'll, and I'll tell you the honest you got truth we didn't i didn't even see a sign of snakes no skins no you know uh tracks in the sand or any kind of indication that there were snakes which i felt good about and uh and i don't wear those tall boots or gators because i want to have <laughs> i want to be able to walk for seven to yeah. 10 miles a day yeah. so uh you know but when i start hearing stories of other guys and being bit or you know having encounters then it starts making you question that rationale for um yeah i mean <laughs> the, the potential's there it's it's an interesting place you gotta go yeah we'll see um <laughs> like, <laughs> we'll see so you were there for what kind of you were there for quail right yeah, so New Mexico has um, four species of quail, but three of those are considered desert species. So, uh, well, all four are, but three of them are more in southern New Mexico. So they've got bobwhite, but that's not the one I was after. It was they've got scaled quail, um, merns, and and gambles, which are basically considered the three desert species, the ones that are uh, exist primarily in the in the desert southwest. Um, and uh, those those birds. Um, Late in the season, they they're known to uh, uh, join cubbies, so they get in big cubbies together. Um, and uh, the later in the season you get, the faster they run, the less likely to fly, the more likely to just uh, run, run, run as far as they can in front of you uh, and the dogs. And if you have dogs that are experienced in desert hunting, I think that it's super helpful. Uh, my friends who are down there that, that hunt desert quail uh, have 
much better success than than I certainly did. But uh, uh, I, that's I, I just soak that in. Um, you know, it takes uh, my dogs have hunted everywhere with me, and uh, and so it just takes a while to get over that learning curve and understand what. Uh, these birds are doing. My dogs are accustomed to, to a more easterly, northerly bobwhite quail, which yeah. uh, they play much uh, more gentlemanly game where mm-hmm. they hold for points and generally don't run away. And so they kind of associate <laughs> the smell of quail with that. That's not what happens in the desert. Um, yeah, so it, uh, we were it, it, like we were getting in within 15 yards of uh, of coveys of birds, and I could see them, and the dogs would start smelling them, and they just would like take off running and mm. evaporate into nothing. The dogs will be doing circles and these birds are, I mean, they just disappear. I mean, never, never, never flush it, never get them in the air. That's crazy. Uh, it, it, yeah. It, 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 and you hear stories of, uh, uh, or other hunters tell stories about, you know, shooting into them in the ground to flush them and then following up on singles after that. But that's not really my game. Made more, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shoot at us bird on the ground even if it is going to run me in circles through the desert for 10 days that's okay uh, so you know and, and we got shots and did okay um you know and managed to kill two of the three species we got a, a, a scale quail and we got our samples but we didn't never close in on the merns quail um but we'll go back and try it again um is there like and, and the dogs certainly learn is there like a quail grand slam like there is for turkeys like since there's so many species yeah, yeah, there are. Uh, so I'm trying to think. There's six, six or seven in this country. Um, yeah, I just I mentioned the four. Then you've got mountain quail mm-hmm. on top of that. Uh, Japanese quail, which is only in Hawaii and a non-native. So that's six. I think you know. And some people probably wouldn't consider that. I think that's oh, you got California quail. So seven. Yeah, yeah, seven different quail species. So you could do the quail slam. You can get four of them in New Mexico if you worked hard enough. I think in California, you can c- cover all of them except for the uh, Mern's quail, which is the one that's the further, you know, associated with further southwest. So, but yeah, you guys, uh, you know, aspire to that. That's certainly something I mean, I like shooting different species. Um, it's not something I, I, I focus on now. I mean, mm-hmm. it, um, I, uh, it, you know, the slam layout there, I don't even, I'd have to count how many yeah. of the 20 plus species in this country, not including subspecies that, you know, I, I, I've shot a, a good number of them. Most guys only get to about three. They're, you know, they shoot a pheasant because everybody shoots pheasant, and that's the primary upland game that folks know. And then they may shoot one species of quail because that's the quail that's in their backyard. Most uh, most people east of Mississippi, just uh, that's, a, that's the bobwhite quail. And then they may or may not know about rough grouse, although there's lots of other species. But that's, you know... A, most people, that is a plant, honey. Um, yeah. Uh, they don't know that there's uh, so many different opportunities out there. I had no idea. I mean, well, in New no Mexico, idea. so part of the reason I ended up in New Mexico Z, is because, um, uh, you know, this public land debate that's going on right now, uh, which drives me crazy. Huh. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's a, a, a broad element out there that wants to transfer public lands back to the states. Uh, I'm totally against that, but uh, yeah. I wanted to go hunt and finish up the season on uh, on National Wildlife Refuge, which is public land paid for by uh, duck stamps, and so that's kind of why I headed to New Mexico. New Mexico has uh, uh, millions of acres of, of public access between BLM National Forest and National Wildlife Refuge, but that's kind of how we ended up there, um, and you can literally walk your lights off and uh, not cover a tenth of it in your lifetime if you wanted mm-hmm. to. The wildlife refuge where I was hunting, it was, uh, it's 50 primarily, honey. I went out to some BLM land too, but the, it was 57,000 acres. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, I know. And a very hefty portion of it with just a, a literally no road through. I mean, you just, it's foot access only. So, That's um, insane. you know, I think about a half of it, maybe a, a half or a third of it was, was hunting allowed, you know, some of it's in, in refuge, which is good for, uh, because there's a lot of overwintering waterfowl down there, but um, yeah, it's cool. It's a good area. So, did you? Can you camp out there, or did you have to get a um, like a hotel? Well, I got a hotel, but this wildlife refuge there was no camping on. Although that was there were probably uh, six national forests within 20 miles where I could have camped. Uh, 
I was figuring on much colder temperatures. Um, not that I'm uh, totally opposed to camping in cold temperatures, but when you're talking about it being a record high in, uh, that for that time of year and it was 26 degrees at night, if it would have been normal temperatures, I was thinking it was going to be down in the you know, single digits. Sure. Time. And so I got a hotel. Um, but, I, you know, I think there's plenty of camping opportunity there. I mean, and it's beautiful, beautiful country. I mean, uh, you know, and the snakes can crawl into your tent with you and keep you warm. <laughs> so you ended up with three birds. How much were I the non? Not... How much were the non-resident tags? Just out of curiosity, do you remember? Oh, I don't think New Mexico was that bad. Uh, I want to say it was. Oh, you had to put me on the spot on it. I, I, I think know. it was ninety dollars. Oh, so that's, that's not it very wasn't much. Terrible. It wasn't hateful. A small game for non-resident generally is not too hateful. Uh, um, so yeah, it wasn't uh, it wasn't that bad. And I ended up shooting one of each species. Saw a lot more. Uh, so just so I, ca- I came away with a scale quail and a gambles quail, and I went two for four on shooting. So um, uh, I, I see a lot of guys that uh, that probably shoot a lot more birds than that, and um, I'm never one to be that concerned on the. Uh, Heft of the game bag. We were only sh- we were only hunting about uh, two and a half or three hours a day, and we backed that up for about ten days. We gave I gave the dogs one day of rest. We could cover about seven. Uh, I was covering about seven miles uh, during those days, and that means that the setter that I run with, she was at least covering fourteen, probably a little bit more. So she got pretty foot sore after the third day. And we ramped it back a little bit before that, but. We saw a lot of birds, just never could close the gap on them. And I think it's just a, uh, it's a learning curve. And I talk to the guys that are out there and they kind of give me tips on how you, you know, how you account for that. But, uh, uh, for me, it's just as getting more time in the desert. Um, the, the dogs eventually learn, um, and they started to while I was out there over the 10 days. They learned that these quail aren't going to hold like the quail they're used to. Mm-hmm. And so the setter will then start looping way further out. And she started doing that, but I torched her. And the first part of the week, a little bit too much. But, you know, so the, when she figures out that these birds aren't running, she's going to run way, way, way out and try and trap them, try and put the birds between you and her. Um, and I don't even know that that works on desert quail, quite frankly, because they just scatter like I've never seen on the ground. It's, it's amazing to watch. I mean, and to see birds that you're within 15 yards of be able to get away from you and two dogs without flushing, it's it's just not something the dogs are accustomed to. Uh, hmm. Normally, if we're within 15 yards of the bird, it's guaranteed that that lab line is going to get that bird up. And <laughs> these birds are outrunning him through the cactus yeah. to, to to avoid flying. Uh, so you know, uh, but it's I, I kind of like those challenges. You know, sure. I, obviously, go earlier in the season uh, if you can if you can fit it in earlier in the season and not be at risk of uh, putting your dogs at risk with snakes. Then um, you're going to have birds that aren't quite as educated, and uh, uh, you probably hedge your bets a little bit more. I think you know I got intel on where there were more bird density than this area I was in. This area I was in had been through a number of years of drought, and it just recently made a comeback. So there were you know there were I'm not going to complain about the numbers of birds there because I never chased forecasts of how you know how many birds are in an area. We're just out to have fun and hunt. Um, but if I would have went to a place where there were higher densities, I think we would have hedged our bets a little bit more. But uh, I prefer to just you know, you know let's make it let's, let's make it a challenge. Uh, you know, yep. let's make it fun for sure. Cool. Well, if you could say if you could pick like one thing that was your favorite thing about hunting in New Mexico, what would it be? Do you think? Other than the challenge uh, of it, because it's so different than hunting in the Midwest or the East. The sunrises in New Mexico and the sunsets, I mean, it's just, uh, uh, they're, they're unspeakably beautiful. I mean, it is, it, it, you know, I, and I'm taking pictures and video and periscope and it's still not even capturing what it is to see it in person. I mean, it's just absolutely, um, amazingly beautiful. And I think that that contrast between this desert, which is so harsh and so, I mean, literally, everything out there uh, to hurt you versus this beauty that you see in the sunrises and the, uh, 
uh, and even the cactus. I mean, they're just, you know, there's this strange mix between something that's going to, you know, they draw blood on you, but it's just absolutely beautiful in the landscape when you take it as a whole. I think that's, sure. that's kind of what I want, uh, left New Mexico with just going, wow. I mean, that's you awesome. just can't, uh, you got to go back again just to, to, to soak more of it in. Yeah, for sure. That's so cool. Well, and for the listeners who would like to see some photos that you did post, I know you posted some on your Facebook page, facebook.com slash ultimate upland. Go right to the photos and they come right up. And again, you can you always go. follow. I... Always follow you. Did you post any on Twitter too? I think. I'm sure you did. I posted some on Twitter. You know, you can find <laughs> us on Instagram. Not anywhere else online. Everything ultimate upland. Yeah. Easy to find. Totally. Well, cool. Well, thank you for coming on the show and just chat a little bit about chasing some birds in New Mexico. I'm sure we will have you on again since you're my go-to upland bird guy. It's great to be here. And next time you got to go with me, we'll get I mean, you, uh, you know, down there in your snake traps. And then, you know, you can carry me out when I get bit. Right. <laughs> cool. And that'll do it. Thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to support the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash Carrie Zilka, C-A-R-R-I-E-Z-Y-L-K-A, where you can chip in a buck or two. Podcasting isn't free, and your support helps keep the lights on. Don't forget to find the show on iTunes. Just search for Hunt Fish Travel, all one word. Hit the subscribe button. You can also follow me on social media. Just go to huntfishtravel.net and click on the social media icon of your choice. Thank you for listening.